It's been two years since the Taliban, after a lightning campaign, took over Afghanistan. What is the country's situation today? We all know how Iraq continues to suffer from the impact of the disastrous US invasion of 2003. What is the state of its health system? And after some heated contests, we are in the semi-final stage of the FIFA Women's World Cup. What can we look forward to? These are our stories for Daily Debrief. Keep watching and if you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It's been two years since the Taliban took over Afghanistan after a lightning campaign. August 2021 was quite stunning as government forces crumbled and the Taliban triumphed with almost no resistance. Two years later, the situation is quite grim. The economy faces a crisis, the Taliban has enforced brutal social policies, especially regarding the rights of women, and the country is facing its third year of drought-like conditions, according to media reports. To understand the situation, we go to Abdul. Abdul, not exactly the happiest of anniversaries, I would think. But uh, to begin with, for our viewers, could you maybe recollect those uh, those two weeks, those rapid two weeks of August 2021, when everything just turned around, the Taliban suddenly, of course, people knew that the Taliban was gaining strength. There were talks between the Taliban and the US, but then just in a whirlwind kind of a campaign, the Taliban took over. So could you maybe just refresh our memories? Well, uh, in August uh, 2020, it was basically, it Tw sorry, 2021, it was not, it seemed very rapid, but uh, one should not forget that Taliban was building up for ever since the, uh, you can say, the US invasion in 2001, since they moved out of the urban areas and uh, relocated themselves in different part of Afghanistan, they were raising their struggle to come back. But uh, in, in the middle of it, uh, US started a new campaign of a good Taliban and bad Taliban, said that, okay, we need to talk uh, with Taliban. And the talks went on for months. And on the basis of that, it was agreed. It was basically, by and large, agreed that Taliban will basically surrender and be part of the larger Afghanistan politics. But what happened ultimately is Taliban took Afghanistan by force and US had to withdraw in hurry. Uh, uh, first saying that we will withdraw in September, then... Uh, reducing it uh, for a few days, then reducing again. Basically, U.S. was quite uh, unwilling to fight the the assault which was coming from Taliban. So uh, even before uh, it was uh, uh, clear that whether Taliban will take Kabul or not, uh, uh, Americans were completely out of it, left the entire administration of Afghanistan at the mercy of uh, those people who have never had any experience of running the administration independently and which ultimately led to the chaotic situation all over uh, the country and particularly in Kabul where um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were seen at the Kabul airport trying to get out of it. Uh, then there was an attack at the Kabul airport. Then there were different kinds of chaotic scenes all over, uh, uh, all over Kabul and all over Afghanistan. So these were the days which basically... Uh, uh, which we could visualize when we talk about the U.S. withdrawal the, uh, from Afghanistan in 2021. And, and that basically is, you can say, was compared with the uh, U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam in 1975. So that chaotic uh, withdrawal has basically an impact on both the, the, the legitimacy of the so-called U.S.-led uh, uh, administration most of the uh, leaders of the U.S.-backed administration uh, fled the country overnight, including the president at the time. And uh, those who all remained within the country also had no uh, uh, clue what to do. And in fact, they surrendered uh, within hours to Taliban. So Taliban's takeover was, as you rightly pointed out, at, at that particular moment was lightning. But uh, we should not uh, think that it happened in one day or one month. It was basically building up ever since. So entire period uh, since 2001 till uh, 2021, uh, US uh, attempts to portray its invasion as a success, uh, attempt to create an administration in Afghanistan was basically a sham which was exposed within the hours and Afghanistan was taken over by Taliban in 2020.
Well, Abdul, so now let's move on to the important question of what the situation is like today. We've, I think last year, especially 2022, the economic situation drastically deteriorated. It's maybe picked up a bit now, but not too much security for the people of Afghanistan in terms of basic economic uh, criteria and even social uh, conditions. Exactly. See, there are two ways to look at Taliban government since 2021. Of course, uh, one of is uh, there is some kind of stabilization. The chaos which was there in the early days has basically, you can say, slowed down. And there is some kind of, even if it is uh, uh, not ideal, there is some kind of order which has led, which has basically, as you rightly pointed out, has led to some kind of economic uh, stabilization in the country. But that stabilization is basically on the on the basis of uh, something which is not good uh, at all for the common Afghans. Majority of Afghans today are still living in under poverty, more than 80 percent. And some estimates uh, says that more than 90 percent of the Afghans are living uh, below the poverty line. There is uh, no prospect about uh, industrial or any kind of uh, uh, employment generation in the country. Uh, those who are those who are working in some kind of small uh, uh, sectors, even they are being targeted in the name of uh, many things, uh, particularly when it comes to the right of women. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, Taliban has also been successful in kind of curbing the opium production in the country. Those are the things. Security, of course, has improved uh, when you compare it with the um, uh, U.S.-backed administration uh, before Taliban took over. So all those things are there. But when it comes to economic condition at large, and when it comes to the uh, rights of the uh, minorities and women in Afghanistan, those conditions have completely uh, deteriorated. And it seems that the Taliban too, whatever you call it, is does not seem any difference when it comes to the right of women and right of minorities than what Taliban one was. But uh, to just to be uh, uh, kind of uh, clear about one thing, uh, and, and I think I'll repeat here, that uh, Taliban regime uh, is primarily based on foreign aid and there is a huge uh, debate at this moment whether the foreign aid should continue the way it is continuing or uh, it should stop. In fact, uh, the UN estimate says that last year when $3.7 billion uh, foreign aid was collected for Afghanistan, which helped at least uh, sustain the human rights situation in the country, uh, starvation, lack of food, lack of clothing, and so on and so forth. This year, uh, even that target of uh, around $4 billion will not be met. Uh, and, in, uh, and it seems that only 5%, UN, UN claims that only 5% of the $4 billion plus dollar aid required has been raised so far. And uh, so that is the condition that this year is going to be worse than what previous year was when it comes to the foreign aid. One thing uh, uh, which needs to be highlighted that post-Taliban uh, post, uh, takeover of Afghanistan, it has again come under sanctions and uh, U.S. holding billions of dollars of Afghan uh, uh, reserves in its banks and all those things. So the economic deterioration in Afghanistan is not only a doing of what Taliban, it is also basically a result of the U.S.-led sanctions, which basically has hampered any possibility of even the small-scale improvement of the living conditions of common Afghans. Right, and Abdul, finally, of course, uh, you mentioned the situation of women. Could you also maybe quickly take us through the kind of restrictions that and the, and the impact that it has had, especially in terms of humanitarian relief, in terms of the work situation? See, uh, uh, Afghani, uh, ever since Taliban came to power, despite the fact they promised that the women's condition will not be, uh, that women's rights will be protected, we have seen they, they are not allowed to go to schools, they are not allowed to work, they are not allowed to even work in uh, human, uh, basically NGOs which provide humanitarian aid, which basically makes it difficult for uh, the organizations to reach uh, uh, the women in Afghan families. So all these has basically led to, uh, uh, of course, deterioration of uh, condition of women in particular, but also uh, the la it has a larger impact on the uh, country's uh, economy as well. Uh, uh, since women can't go to uh, educational institutions, they can't work, a, a large number of uh, institutions were run by them. That kind of, uh, all of them are shut. 
uh, people are forced to kind of uh, uh, depend on aid uh, for their survival. And uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, attempt yet to basically undo these particular uh, uh, conditions. And uh, when it comes to uh, the debate about how to deal with it, there are, of course, two different versions, and both of them are completely opposed to each other, one uh, uh, claiming that one needs to engage with Taliban, talk with it until we talk, we will not be able to influence it, its policies and so on and so forth. And other uh, set of people saying that sanctions need to be imposed, made it stricter. So these are two completely opposed worldviews uh, available uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, uh, Taliban government uh, at this hour in Afghanistan, and which basically makes it very difficult for anyone to take a, a, a clear stand on what should be the way ahead uh, uh, when it comes to uh, Afghanistan and its recognition or the people and so on and so forth. Thanks, Abdul, for giving us that update. Very important uh, country to keep watch. Lot of issues there. Thank you so much for talking to us. From Afghanistan, we go to another country which faced the brunt of US invasion. We're talking about Iraq. We have often heard about the huge toll in terms of lives lost, the injuries. The political instability that Iraq faces today is also a legacy of that invasion. 20 years later, we take a look at the state of healthcare in the country for which we go to Anna Richard. Anna, of course, uh, Iraq spent uh, many, Iraq faced many, many years dealing with political instability, with chaos, with very violent, uh, you know, a lot of violence. We know ISIS was also there. So maybe could you first take us through, say, what the general state of the country's healthcare? Well, uh, I mean, uh, the health system in Iraq is, I would say, quite interesting because it went uh, from the state in the 1970s and 1980s when it was uh, recognized as one of the best in the region uh, to being completely overwhelmed by uh, the effects of the sanctions of the wars that uh, have gone, uh, th that have happened uh, since then. And so essentially uh, what uh, activists on the ground are reporting now is that there is a very weak system, essentially, especially when we talk about the public health system, um, we choose to be organized around primary health care and the provision of primary health care in centers uh, to a bit of a patchy uh, distribution of health services across the country, uh, with cities, uh, of course, uh, being in somewhat of a better position than of the rural areas. Um, and of course, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, reasons behind this, not only, not only the war, but also the level of investment that can be made for uh, for health uh, do, uh, at this time, uh, as well as, of course, um, the impact of what the U.S. allies um, essentially did uh, since since the invasion in, 20, uh, in 2003. Uh, so what several reports have shown is that essentially uh, health authorities or even health policymakers in Iraq were not consulted as the new plans for the health system were developed after the invasion. Uh, and that, of course, uh, health uh, health was not very high on the list of priorities uh, of, uh, um, of these forces. So uh, essentially uh, what we're looking at now is that um, there has been, you know, a lot of talk about reconstruction, about uh, rebuilding the health system. Uh, but at the moment, uh, it's simply not there. Uh, the, these promises have very minimally, uh, they have been realized very in a very minimal uh, way. And essentially, it's putting at risk most of those people who live outside of Baghdad uh, or live outside of, uh, of the other bigger cities. Right, Anna, in this context, of course, uh, when you talk about health, very important to talk about the role of the private sector as well, because that often, you know, has a very outsized role and sometimes even a very negative role. So what is the state of privatization of healthcare in Iraq? Well, uh, interestingly, but yes, not surprisingly, of course, uh, it, uh, the private sector has grown as the public sector has, um, um, has fallen uh, in, uh, in extent. And that also has a lot to do uh, with how the post-invasion policies were made. Uh, those were made and tailored uh, essentially uh, to favor uh, the private sector, to favor uh, private constructors who would come in and then build or not build uh, health centers or hospitals or, or uh, whatever else. So essentially right now, 
And again, this is something that's been mirrored in uh, some of the most recent reports on health in Iraq, is that uh, the private health sector uh, has uh, has been strengthened, uh, not only in the typical way that we see, you know, uh, in terms of hospitals or clinics, uh, but uh, there's um, there's also a lot of strengthening in particular areas like cosmetic uh, medicine or even lab uh, lab di diagnostics, which is something that we usually wouldn't talk about, but um, some of the reports and some of the researchers that uh, have been uh, following this topic uh, lately uh, are singling out as uh, as something to, to, to look out for. Essentially, what's happening is that the labs are targeting uh, patients directly, so they're advertising uh, some procedures, some tests that might not be relevant for the people at all, but are a very good way to, uh, to, to make a profit on. So, uh, you know, Add to that that these labs and uh, the other private health uh, health resources are held by by military militias by uh, by a very uh, small group of people. It's essentially uh, pushing health in Iraq towards a very very dangerous place. Thank you so much, Anna, for speaking to us about the situation in Iraq. And finally, we are at the semi-final stage of the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023. Spain, Sweden, Australia, and England are the final teams in contention. The quarterfinals saw some closely fought matches, including a penalty shootout. We are with the Siddhant Ane for more. Siddhant, we are at the semi final stage again. Lots of interesting football ahead. But first, let's take a look at the quarters, which saw some very close matches, including a penalty shootout. What do you think? Absolutely, Prashant. All the games, in fact, were uh, pretty close run affairs, except for uh, Spain, uh, of course. Uh, and again, like, like we talked about before on the show as well, the gaps uh, you know, between the teams that reached the later stages of the competition uh, haven't shown the kind of uh, massive differences in quality that we uh, have become used to when we come to these big tournaments and, and you know, get, get to these kind of deciding uh, parts of, of these tournaments. Uh, <clears throat> extremely, extremely um, exciting games going down to the wire, going into extra time. Um, in fact, actually, one of the interesting things that has come up uh, over the course of this tournament, particularly because of Australia doing so well, being one of the home nations, uh, the host countries, that is, uh, is that <clears throat> the viewership numbers for these Australia games have shattered uh, all records you can imagine. Uh, going back as far as uh, 20 years and even uh, some are saying coming close to the all-time uh, Australian record for uh, a sporting event, which is Cathy Freeman's 400-meter finals at the Sydney Olympics back in the year 2000. Uh, in fact, the interesting part, uh, even more interesting, is, is that uh, the other major events have been Cathy Freeman's, of course, 2000, uh, that Olympic Games uh, final. Uh, but the other was Ash Barty's uh, 2022 uh, Grand Slam final. So all you know, women's sporting events getting these kind of massive numbers, which completely sort of rips apart uh, the narrative that has been built over so many years by marketing executives and television executives and sports executives, uh, saying that the reason uh, women's sport isn't encouraged given the kind of platforms, uh, given the kind of pay parity and prize money that men's sport tend to get is because they simply don't draw the numbers. And what we've seen, at least in this part of the world, as far as this tournament is concerned, uh, that that is completely uh, untrue, Prashant. And uh, we're expecting the semi-finals to draw even bigger crowds. And some of these numbers also don't include the you know broadcasts that are going out to public venues. Like major sporting venues in Australia have been opened up uh, for live broadcasts, free uh, for people to enter, including the Melbourne uh, Cricket Ground, the Sydney Cricket Ground, uh, iconic sporting venues like that where 50, 60, 70,000 people uh, can come and watch the game on large screens. Uh, here there's conversation about uh, public holiday uh, if the Matildas, as they are known, uh, go on to win the World Cup. Of course, that's still a while away. Uh, but in the meantime, both on the pitch, the kind of competitiveness we're seeing, uh, the kind of tactical as well as technical football we're seeing, um, and how closely fought all the matches have been uh, right up to the quarterfinal stage, uh, the fact that, I mean, I, for, for example, we did a, a bit of a show uh, on one of our channels and, and I, I was uh, hoping for or predicting, uh, as these things go, uh, uh, Japan coming through uh, on one side and France going through on the other for a potential final. That's completely not worked out. So that just goes to show, uh, I think, one small example 
of how closely sort of contested uh, this World Cup is and how much excitement is drumming up. Uh, I've also been sp- speaking to some people who do gla- grassroots football Prashant, here in Australia and also people getting together from elsewhere in the world who are talking about how much of a difference this is making to younger players who are getting into the sport. Uh, and, you know, uh, again, those going back to some of those television numbers, uh, over 90% of that television audience was uh, a young audience between the ages of, let's say, 15 and, and 30, 35. You know, so, so uh, among uh, maybe a more active sort of younger uh, demographic set, uh, clearly there, there is no real difference uh, between this World Cup and any other World Cup that has happened. And be- maybe because it's at home, there's a little more attention. Uh, but we're hoping with the semi-finals that will uh, pick up even more. And we have uh, a couple of really, really interesting games to look out for. Uh, Sweden are playing on one side and looking extremely strong. Uh, Spain look like they've recovered so well from that loss uh, to Japan. Um, you know, and, and that, that should be a mouth-watering quarter-final that uh, comes up on the 15th ahead of, uh, of course, England versus Australia. Um, and we can talk a bit more uh, about that if you want later on. Right, Asidant, yes. So, just maybe very briefly, quick look at the two matches. How do the teams look? So, I mean, of course, uh, you know, we all talk about, uh, in a sporting sense, anyone but England. And that's very much the case here. Uh, so, I was reading a report coming out of the English camp where they essentially know that outside of England, everyone is rooting for them to not go through to the final. And they're sort of uh, channeling that pressure and, and they seem to be, or they, they claim to be thriving off it. Uh, the interesting thing when it comes to this stage, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, that organization and defensive structure will become uh, critical to teams doing well. We've already seen this. It's not uh, likely to be a very free-flowing football with lots of goals and all of that. So, uh, it'll be tension uh, all the way through. And uh, in the end, the sides that are able to keep their composure keep their structure and shape uh, and remain most organized defensively will have the best chances going forward. Uh, England are in their third straight Women's World Cup uh, semi-final. Um, and, and, you know, that's a, that's a major uh, point there. Every time, uh, you know, they reach the later stages, any English team reaches the late, later stages of, of a competition, the talk of football coming home uh, comes up. Uh, and this, this, this is no exception. They are, of course, reigning European champions as well. Uh, Australia are keeping the flag flying for the Asian continent who they represent uh, from a football perspective. And on the other side, we have two strong teams with with great pedigree. I mean, uh, Sweden have been uh, World Cup champions before, way back in the mid-90s. And Spain, I mean, we all know uh, Spain and football, it it pretty much runs in in their blood. So, um, very exciting semi-finals coming up, uh, Prashant, and, and a huge amount of excitement, at least on the ground here in Australia. Um, and hopefully the rest of the world also kind of catching up at least where time difference allows. Right, so that, <clears throat> thank you so much for that update. We'll definitely be watching those matches and we'll come back to you just before the finals. Definitely very interesting competition so far. And that's all we have time for today in this edition of Daily Debrief. We'll be back on Wednesday with more stories from around the world, more stories of struggles, more stories of demands of people's movements, more stories of geopolitical interest for us, which tell us a lot about our world today and tomorrow. So keep watching, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button.